So here we have the first question is n by 18 an integer? So it's typically type 1 question which needs to be answered in the form of either yes or no. Now let's see the first statement. The first statement reads 5n over 18 is an integer. Now let me tell you that what many of us actually think 5n over 18 is an integer. Then many students start answering this question in a way that 5 and 18 have no common factor. That means for this result to be an integer, n itself must be divisible by 18. So n should be either 18 or 36 or 54, etc. In fact, n is always divisible by 18. Therefore, they say that the first statement alone is sufficient. And that's where they make mistakes. And that is where rule number 3 comes into picture. And rule number 4 at the same time as well. Now, here, the assumption that we took was that 5n is divisible by 18 whereas it's not necessary that 5n is divisible by 18 so what you have to do is go to rule number four always dig out what has the question not mentioned over here what is the question silent about then you will realize that the question does not mention any property about n which means since the question is silent about n so while n can be positive n can be negative as well similarly while n can be integer and can be fraction as well so you will always have an answer because no information about n is given so n can be anything now you should always define that anything in your mind that it could be positive negative it could be integer it could be fraction and the moment you do that you realize what you have not thought so far for example when i thought about this question in this way i have not thought about any possible value of n which could be in fraction for the example 5n over 18 will be an integer even if n is 18 over 5 because n can have a denominator 5 which cancels out this 5 and 18 will be cancelled out by this denominator 18 so the result will be 1. So while n can be 18 by 5 it can be 18 as well and that leads us to the conclusion that the answer to the question is sometimes yes and sometimes no which means the first statement alone is not sufficient. So this is how you must always deal with the statement rule number 3 and 4. They should work simultaneously. Rule number 3, try to prove that the statement is not sufficient. Rule number 4, always find out the missing information of the question. That means what the question is silent on. Right? Always acknowledge that. The alternative way to answer the same thing would be 5n over 18 is an integer. So take it on face value. The integer values are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc which means n can be 18 by 5, 36 by 5, 54 by 5, 72 by 5, and 18, etc. So while 18 is divisible by 18, the remaining four values are not divisible, so it is not sufficient, and option A and option D can be eliminated. Now the second statement, second statement tells us that 3n by 18 is an integer, that means n over 6 is an integer, which means we can say that n is an integer multiple of 6, which means the values of n can be either 6 or 12 or 18 etc. That's why 18 gives yes. The other values give no to the question, no to the answer to the question. Therefore, we say that the second statement alone as well is not sufficient and B option can be eliminated here. Now, in the third step, when you combine the two statements, then understand how we are combining because that also is an art that we have to develop and we have to learn. The first statement says that 5n over 18 is an integer. Now, using the first statement, there were several values of n that we had obtained. Right? Two possible cases. One, when the values are in fraction. When they are in fraction, then we always see that the denominator is 5 in them. And the numerator is a multiple of 18. And second possible values of n were the multiples of 18 like 18, 36, 54, etc. But the second statement now mandates that n has to be an integer because it's an integer multiple of 6. That means now when we combine the two statements, we should just quickly look at the values that have the common properties of the first and second statements both. And then you realize that now the values of n can only be the multiples of 18 because all the values in fraction that we got in the first statement are not acceptable as for the second statement. So we can rule them out. So finally we get only those values of n which are multiples of 18. That means together we find the two statements are sufficient and therefore the answer to the question becomes option C. So this is how we answer this first type of data sufficiency question. 
Remember, rule number three and rule number four should always work one after the other. Number one, you have to prove that the statement is not sufficient. And number two, that always find out the missing information in the question because basing that only you can comfortably and easily prove that the information is not sufficient. Right? So now, I will quickly take you to the next question here. The next second question, second example of such type is right here. So once again, I always insist the students that before you proceed to see this video, you should always try to solve this question yourself. You should have your answer handy so that you can always check that where exactly did you go wrong, if at all, if you went wrong somewhere in the question. Here the question is asking is x square minus y square divisible by 8? So the answer to the question needs to be given in the form of either yes or no. Also something that we can quickly think is an algebraic property that x square minus y square is equal to x plus y multiplied by x minus y. So we have to find out whether the result of these two things multiplication is divisible by 8 or not. Let us see the first statement. The first statement is x and y are even integers. Right? x and y are even. Rule number 3. Try to prove that the statements are not sufficient, that the statement is not sufficient. So let's quickly substitute x square minus y square. If I take x equal to 4 and y equal to 2, 4 square minus 2 square is 16 minus 4, that is 12, which is not divisible by 8. So the answer to the question is no. But if I choose the value of x to be 6 and y to be 2, 6 square minus 2 square is 36 minus 4, which is 32. And that is divisible by 8. That means the first statement. Now we have proven that the first statement alone is not sufficient and now we can eliminate option A and D. The second statement when we see, we see that x plus y is divisible by 8. Now this is where most of us start getting tricked, right? Since we know that x square minus y square is equal to x plus y times x minus y and the second statement confirms that x plus y is divisible by 8. So we say that the result also has to be divisible by 8. So the second statement alone is sufficient. But now, my dear friend, you are going in the wrong direction because that is where once again rule number 4 comes into picture. Always think about the missing information in the question. Did the question mention anything about x and y? Did the question say anything about x and y in terms of their properties? The answer is no. Which means you don't have to necessarily think about the integer values of x and y only. What if I choose the value of x as 5.7 and the value of y as 2.3? Then x plus y is divisible by 8. But if you calculate x square minus y square, that will be 5.7 square minus 2.3 square. That won't even be an integer, forget about divisible by 8. So the answer to the question will be no. And if you take 5 and 3, then x square minus y square will be 5 square minus 3 square, so certainly divisible by 8, right? So answer will be yes. So we have been able to prove now that the second statement is not sufficient and you realize the reason behind our success in proving the statement not sufficient was the ability to identify that the question has given nothing about x and y. We capitalized that and we also thought about non-integer values of x and y. Now certainly when you combine these two statements in this question, you realize that the first statement tells you that x and y are integers. If x and y are integers, then x plus y will be integer as well as x minus y will be an integer, which and x plus y is also divisible by 8 as per the first, second statement. That means two integers multiplied out of them. If one is divisible by 8, the result has to be divisible by 8. That means the answer to the question will be yes. So the two statements together are definitely sufficient to answer the question and hence the answer to this particular question becomes option C. Alright, so if we had made that mistake, we would have said the answer is B, that would have been incorrect. But since together the two statements are sufficient because the first statement gives us the property of X and Y that they are integers. So using that information and using the information of second statement that X plus Y is a multiple of it, we are arriving at a conclusion that x square minus y square is an integer multiple of 8 for sure. I hope you enjoyed this explanation and after this we will move to the third example once again to understand the same question, the same rules that we have been rephrasing. Thank you so much.